Hello everybody and welcome to Pisa Presents. Today we're going to be looking at the famous fossil quote scale tree, Lepidodendron. Now our story begins, or at least it's set in the beginning, in the Carboniferous period and just because of where our club is located, Pennsylvania. So now first of all, when is the Carboniferous period? Well, we're looking at a time from roughly 359 to 299 million years ago. It's subdivided into two different divisions. It depends on really whether or not you're in Europe, what names you go by. Now, if you're in the continental United States, it is the Mississippian and the Pennsylvanian are the subdivisions. Elsewise, it's late or early Carboniferous. Now, this period was named by Richard Kerwin in 1799. It was named that because if you think of certain fossils and geologic material like say coal that contains a lot of carbon to it so because a lot of this material coming out of this time period was very carbon bearing he named it the carboniferous now classically during the, this time because always of course the continents are shifting earth was concerned with two very large land masses so laurasia or laurusia according to some, is in the north, and Gondwana is in the south. Now, we, meaning Pennsylvania, is actually by the equator during this time, which gave us a very warm and humid equatorial climate. It very much lent itself to the coal forest, which were large, thickly wooded wetlands that was really the source of a lot of the coal deposition that we're enjoying today and have in the past. So in the beginning of the Carboniferous, the atmosphere by us was about 20% oxygen, but by the end it was 35%. Why is that? Well, this climate was so good for plants that the amount of plants on the planet just like virtually exploded in number. So all of these plants just lend to a lot more oxygen in the air. So all of this organic material and all this plant activity enriched the paleosols or ancient soils, which allowed in turn roots to establish very well. So then you were allowing yourself to get trees to evolve even bigger and even larger. So one thing sequentially led to the other. And just because of the time period, you didn't really have in the beginning when Lepidodendron evolved, a lot of plants evolving via flowers, you just seeds, you didn't really have that. They really more so reproduced by spores. So here is a little still from actually the Natural History Museum in London, which if any of our viewers are by there, or if you ever have the chance to go, I can very highly recommend it. It's an absolutely lovely place and just such charming guides there. They're so sweet. You wanted to pinch everybody. They were so adorable. So Lipidodendron is actually Greek for scale tree. Now, tree I basically use in Dr. Evil style air quotes because it wasn't a tree. It wasn't either a fern and it wasn't a moss. So despite what Wikipedia and a lot of other common use image sources can tell you, no, it, it wasn't. It definitely wasn't a club moss. I wish people would stop calling it a club moss. That annoys the heck out of me. So what you have here is a vascular lycopod plant. Now, translating that from the Klingon, so a vascular plant is one that has a xylem and a phloem, which are specialized tissues that allow you to move around uh, sugars and waters. A lycopod is a plant that has oppositely branching stems that reproduce by spores. So it's a specialized plant with tissues that allow it to move around nutrients very easily that reproduces by spores. Now, in terms of the size, what are we looking at here? So you're looking at up to and slightly over 160 foot tall altogether. Yes, entire trunks of this have been found, bases of trunks, even root networks. It's absolutely amazing looking at some of these things. And said trunks were about three to six foot or more diameter at the base, and then they tapered upward. Altogether, you're looking at a 10 to 15 year growth cycle, and these trees, and again, trees I use in implied air quotes, and I really only call them trees because that's kind of the familiar term. There are nearly over 
there's nearly three dozen species of these, which really shows you how prolific these were. I mean, they really just were able to take over the environments when they got in. So now, science, like many things, occasionally has its little bumps here and there towards progress. Now, on the left-hand side, you can see the image, and these are from the same source, mind you, which I thought was actually a very good example to show people. So on the left, you have, quote, Lepidodendron compared with club moss. Club moss is the sort of scrappy-looking plant on the left with the base with the little bit sticking out of it, for lack of a better explanation. Now, that is actually a fairly decent image of it. It shows one of the cones of the plants, of course, obviously. And then you go on the right. Restoration of a Lepidodendron. No, they didn't really look like that. So, again, just to keep in mind that paleontology, like many sciences, moves and alters and changes with the time. So, just take some of these older sources with occasionally a grain of salt. Although still they're quite fun and can give you a lot of good information. So now this is an older source. This is going right to the horse's mouth. This is in fact a fossilized Lepidodendron tree trunk from North Yorkshire in England. So wood and branches. These did not have growth rings. You can see right there that is actually a cross section of the stem and then went in very, very close. Now, look at all those cells in the interior, how all those cells are just big and they have all those large openings. Those are the xylem and the phloem. They have to be very big because these trees, again, I don't know why I'm doing air quotes to the computer. It's seriously, it's like I'm Dr. Evil or something. It's all these openings had to be big to allow the water and nutrients to go up and nourish the rest of the tree. But still, you can see there aren't any growth rings or anything like that in here, which, yes, because this is a very deep cross section, you wouldn't necessarily see, but still it's, and that's very classic of this plant. They're what's called unifacial, which means that they only made cells in the interior and you didn't have structures like that. Now, altogether, the base itself was more woody than the terminal branches, the ones all the way up top. And that's because that the trunk and stems were made of a very sponge-like material, which that sponge-like tendency of it increased the further up you went. So one of the ideas about this is, is that Lepidodendron may have been very prone to winds because only because of just how this material is. Some paleontologists think that it might have been a little bit like, oh, I'm going to flop over now and just that it wasn't necessarily as strong as a regular plant, but I don't know. I'm not too sure about that. I mean, you can think of lots of plants like palm trees and whatnot that aren't necessarily the biggest, yet they can handle pretty decently in large winds. So I don't know. Another thing to table for another day in science. So there are very, very specific names given to the different parts of Lepidodendron, which can cause a lot of confusion. So Lepidophyloides are the leaves, and actually on the right there is a close-up of some of the leaves, so to speak. And if you look at kind of the tippy top of it, where it almost looks like it's going to go into a point, and then part of it's breaking off, and there's a little bit of that white right there, those are actually, um, yeah, the very tips of the leaves themselves. So Lepidostrobus are cones, and the Eulodendron are branch scars. Now, speaking of scars, the actual scars of the Lepidodendron, or probably the leaf scars, are their most characteristic feature, with this right here being a selection of them, bark, and some fossilized trees from the site in the United Kingdom. So down there in the lower right, and also center left, you have some pretty, pretty good looks at leaf scars, which are when a leaf falls off the stem or a trunk, what have you, it leaves behind these very, very characteristic for Lepidodendron markings. And they're absolutely, absolutely stunningly beautiful, I think. But you compare that to the rest of the fossils, and I don't know, I mean, does that remind you of anything? Because it sure as heck did remind a couple of people back in the day of something. 
So now, Lepidodendron itself is Greek for scale tree. That kind of references in a tongue-in-cheek way that when these fossils were first being found, people thought that they were actually of reptiles. That how this bark is, how just scaly it looks, it's a very, it's, I don't know, for lack of a better word, it's very primeval almost. It's a very great look for a fossil. But people thought that they were reptiles. And then, of course, time went on and they're like, oh, this is a plant. Now, there's a term noria, which may reference the underbark of a lepidodendron. That's one of those terms that scientists are kind of debating about whether or not should be officially adopted or retired. And, well, speaking of terms that are a big pain in the butt with this, first of all, if you see this sigillaria, you kind of look at that, it almost looks like individual, uh, like very, very tiny twigs next to each other with these little divots like you stuck sort of like a, a semi-flattened straw in there. It doesn't really have the shape of a classic leaf scar or the bark itself of a lepidodendron. I've seen sometimes in shows and also too on the internet, not to call out anybody because a lot of the time some of these sites are pretty famous, but if you're shopping for one or the other, just be sure that you don't buy lepidodendron and get sigillaria or vice versa. But okay, the problem part, stigmaria. This thing can be a pain and people still make this mistake to this day. Whether or not it's through lack of knowledge or just trying to sell you something, I don't know. But stigmaria are actual lepidodendron roots. It's still a lepidodendron. It is not a different plant at all whatsoever. It's the same gosh darn thing. So back in the day, when they were still trying to really classify and figure out what this thing is. Is it a fern? Is it a tree? Just what the heck is going on? Now, these roots look so different from the rest of the established parts of the plant that scientists thought it was a completely different plant altogether until they started finding a lot of like that picture that was back from, I believe that was actually in Scotland that was taken in where it showed a lot of the trunks and then you had the root networks and then scientists are able to be like, uh-oh, these are actually the same gosh darn plant. And then also too, as soon as they had the root network, they were able to determine, well, this really isn't a moss. And this kind of, I mean, we can see all these fossilized inner tissues right now. This is a vascular plant. This isn't a moss or anything. And it also led to pretty much the classification of it. Although, yes, it is still kind of called a tree just for familiarity's sake. It's not really a tree. Now, why do you have so many fossils of stigmaria? Well, each root of lipidodendron had rows of spiral rootlets. So that's why this is such a prolific fossil. Also too, because these trees could get so darn big, just imagine how big the root network was. Now, a theory, and again, I emphasize a theory, is, is that these roots had a symbiotic relationship with fungi, possibly one that allowed them to get up water more efficiently. But again, that's something that hasn't ever been really established. And of course, all good things come to an end, very much like the reign of our dear friend, the Lepidodendron. So they were around from the Carboniferous to the Triassic, peaking out at just about 205 million years ago. Now, theories as to why abound, but basically fall into two different categories. One is competition from the rising group of plants, the uh, flowering plants, just competition for resources, for land, for space, and also too a changing climate. Right around towards the end of Lepidodendron's existence as a group, there was a cold snap. And so one of the theories is, is that this cold snap they couldn't really adjust to very well and because these trees were very very large they just couldn't simply survive it as well as a plant that was more easily adaptable. So where can you find some of these in the Northeast in Pennsylvania? Well first of all if you go on that MnDOT page down below and again I will always continue to sing the praises of MnDOT they are marvelous you can actually look up some sites for Lepidodendron 
where you are, wherever you are. It doesn't have to be just in Pennsylvania, but it is found in 10 counties in PA alone. It's in and around coal seams and coal bearing rocks like the Glenshaw and Llewellyn formations. And just keep in mind that when you go to buy these or you're looking at them in shows, beware of their alternate names of fossil parts, being sure that people aren't telling you that say, again, the roots or something else is really a different plant because I still sadly see that happening a lot. And also too, the confusion with sigillaria. Just be sure that you're getting the right thing and what you want. And now, probably the one and only TikTok reference that I will ever, ever do on this channel. <laughs> so yes, Lepidodendron is sadly extinct. But if you are seeing this tree, you have not necessarily fallen into some rip of the fabric of time. You're just looking at an absolutely awesome fossil that dominated the coal forest of this planet for several million years. So thank you very much, folks. Enjoy your day. And now go out there.